the chapter that we just read is a really intense chapter in the life of David. Um, you could say that about many of the chapters, of course. Following the life of David, as you guys have been doing, um, brings a lot of things to mind, a lot of challenges in the lives of other people, all connected to the life of David. Uh, but tonight we're going to look at um, not so much David, a little bit, because he's a key part of this story, and not even really Bathsheba. Tonight's not really about Bathsheba. Um, it's about Uriah. And young people, my appeal to you tonight as we read this important chapter is I want you to feel friendship with the man Uriah. I want, to feel, I want you to feel like you can stand next to him tonight and be challenged by his integrity. I want you to, as we read through this record in all of its detail, I want you to catch his fire tonight. And I want you to love him and be challenged by what he speaks to us today in 2023. And you know, young people, you're not really too dissimilar to Uriah. Um, none of you are Jewish and neither was he. He was not an Israelite. He chose to align himself with God and many of you have done the same. He chose to align himself with the principles of the kingdom of God and you have too. And yet he stood in a time where there was challenges around him and he burned like a flame in the darkness. What he's gonna say to you, tonight, uh, to you tonight, young people, is not an easy message. It's not something that we've come here tonight to be um, just sort of patted on the back. He certainly doesn't do that. He challenges me and I'm assuming he's gonna challenge you in really amazing ways but he challenges us to be better disciples of Christ and to actually live the words of the hymn that we just sang. This is obviously a story in 2 Samuel chapter 11 of David and Bathsheba, and that's, that's where our focus normally is, but it's also about Uriah. And just a word about David as we jump in to the story. Young people are going to say a lot of critical things about David tonight because the record does. The inspired record highlights David's sins in a way that few other chapters in his life does. I will take the lead from the spirit of the inspired word on that. But I want you to remember all of, all of, during all of this tonight, young people, that 150 years after this time of David, it was said to a future king of Israel that you need to be inspired to be like the king David. For he served me and he had integrity, except in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. So don't ever forget tonight that David was a man after God's own heart. Um, he loved God. He was a man who was faithful. He, had, he was passionate about the ark, as we'll see. And yet he too had his faults. And we're going to highlight those tonight. But don't forget that integrity is something that none of us can do perfectly. And yet we're going to stand with Uriah to be inspired to do better. There's a couple things in this chapter that are really curious as we start to read. And, and the, the, the first part of tonight is just going to look at the overview of this chapter so you can be impressed with how God wrote this chapter. Um, there's some silence in this chapter that's a bit unusual. The first one is we're never told once what any of the character's inner thoughts or feelings are about what transpires in this chapter. With the small exception of Uriah, who speaks his mind about his convictions, but we're never given insight into Bathsheba's mind, David's mind, Joab's mind, Uriah's mind, or the messengers that were involved in this story that were taking notes back and forward. The other thing that's really curious about this chapter is it's still, no matter how much time you spend with this chapter, there's always going to be a lingering doubt of whether you not Uriah knew what was going on. Now, there's still a bit of doubt in my mind, but I'm fairly convinced. I don't know, maybe 70%, and I'm going to share that with you tonight. But the record never tells us, never gives us insight. Oh, and by the, by the way, someone told Uriah what happened, and now he knows. We are completely left in the dark. It's up to us to think about. The other amazing thing about this record as it progresses is it's almost like we're desperate for God to intervene and do something, but he doesn't. And he lets terrible things happen in 2 Samuel chapter 11 at the hands of David. And we never find out what God, his perspective is. We obviously know it as readers 
thinking about our conscience and about God's principles until the very end. The literal bottom line of the story is God's judgment on what David did. Just look at, look at verse 27. Speaking of Bathsheba, and when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house and she became his wife and bore him a son. And this is the first time that we learn about God's perspective since when he, in chapter seven, gave the covenant to David. And the first time God speaks since that covenant is right in the next chapter, in chapter 12. And it says, the thing that David had done displeased Yahweh. But all the rest of the story, we're left wondering, when's God gonna do something? What's he feeling about this or what David's doing now? Now, I'm just gonna put the question to you. Why do you think it's written like that? I think this is good Bible study. It's good to ask the question about why God wrote things the way he did. Okay, so I think I'll just say that um, because I think Luke's on it. I didn't have that written in my notes, but I think that's really good. So I might write it in after, but it's actually true. I think what this record's doing is it's not telling you in any of those things, which we're kind of desperate to know because God wants you to enter into this really intense chapter. You've got to really follow the characters and think like when David sends that message, you think, whoa, what was David thinking? And what is the person who's getting the message thinking? And what about the person who's carrying the message? Do they know what's going on? All of those things force us to enter into this chapter Because, young people, this chapter is cutting to our hearts. It is about your conscience, and it's about pricking your conscience and getting right in there. And God wants you wrapped into this story to really think about what's going on. There's not too many doubts towards the end when we find the conclusion in chapter 12, but God wants you to get into that chapter, think about it carefully, and apply it to yourself. And I think that's part of the reason why there's silence. Now, let's also look at this chapter um, in the context of what we have. I'm not sure if you've, I always love to see the context of where the chapter is because it almost always brings out lessons and here it definitely does. Um, the, the incident with Bathsheba and Uriah is right smack in the wars, in the middle of the wars with Ammon. So the wars with Ammon start in chapter 10 and uh, they, they, well, if you look at chapter 10, verse one, it happened after this, that the king of the people of Ammon died and Haran, his son, reigned in his place. Now it starts off with this act of kindness. Um, David says, oh, well, that's, that's too bad. You might be kind of sad about that. So he tries to extend kindness um, to the Ammonites. And we'll see why that's interesting in the context as well. But they don't receive it and the wars with Ammon start. And we're told in this record, we're not gonna point out all these details, but it's very clear in chapter 10 that David is out with Israelites and Joab in the army. He's, he's actually doing battle. He's out to battle. At the end of the episode with David, Bathsheba, and Uriah, come to chapter 12. This is worth just kind of making a little pencil line to see that the story changes. The wars with Ammon continue in chapter 12, verse 26. Look at, now Joab fought against Rabbah of the people of Ammon and took the royal city. Of course, um, Joab sends messengers to David because he's in, uh, in the city. And David gathers all the people in verse 29 and he joins them. So look at verse 31. The very end of verse 31, that David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. So David is out to battle. But right smack in the middle, you have the incident of chapter 11. And David is not out to battle, he's at home. And so young people, the big picture of the story of David here in chapter 11 is that there's war with Ammon, right? And he's out to battle in chapter 10 and he's out to battle in chapter 12. But in the middle, he realizes that there's a much greater enemy than the Ammonites. There's someone else, there's something else that needs battle done with it. And it's not the Ammonites. His greatest enemy is on the rooftop with himself and his own mind. It's sin. It's not the Ammonites. Right, so right in the middle of the story, David is at home and he realizes that there's something far more insidious than the Ammonites that's threatening Israel. And it certainly threatened Israel. Now, a larger picture of the story, and I think it's important to have all this in mind before we jump into the details. Look where else we fit here, right? Second Samuel chapter 11, but look, go back to chapter six. What's happened in the lead up to this intense chapter? Well, in chapter six, you probably remember from previous studies, that's where we find out that David loves the ark so much. He's dancing, he's so excited, and he's passionate about the ark. And he says in chapter seven, verse one, he's upset that the ark is still dwelling in curtains, right? Like in a tent. And he's like, no, we gotta do something about that. He's so excited. He gets the covenant. God speaks via Nathan in chapter seven. 
When you come to chapter eight, the kingdom's under control, right? You read that, we won't read it, but eight verse 15 to 18 gives, gives a real clear description, makes us as the reader feel like David's in control. There's order and there's justice in this nation. And then you come to chapter nine and you've, you've, you get a picture of the character of David. Um, he, he wants to extend the kindness of God to someone else. Do you remember who that was? Who was, who was he trying to show kindness to in chapter nine? Yes, for Jonathan's sake, in verse one. Well, look at verse three. Then the king said, is there not still someone in the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? So it's the son of Jonathan, right? So you get this beautiful picture, David showing kindness in chapter nine. And then if it's, it's worth walking in your, in your Bible, come to chapter 10. Now he's showing kindness in verse two. Look at this. Then David said, I will show kindness to Hanan, the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness to me. So David's portrayed as this gregarious, really kind ruler who's got everything under control and, and everything's going well. And then he stays home and he looks out over his balcony and everything of the previous chapters becomes unraveled. The ark becomes dis disregarded. David's at home. Where is the ark in chapter 11? Uriah points it out. It's in a tent in the paddock, right? It's out to battle with the other people and David's not there. He's, he's at home in his little kind of palace, right? The ark is disregarded by David. He acts against the covenant in chapter 11. He's out of control and there's chaos and injustice in this chapter. And he's selfish to an Israelite and he's blue, brutal to a non-Israelite, to Uriah the Hittite, who's joined Israel. And so then God enters the record again. So that's the context of this chapter. There's a lot going on. And God's saying to us that this is an important exception to David's life. And yet it's incredibly instructive and serious. So let's look at our main character, Uriah the Hittite. Um, first, let's just start with who he is, right? We learn about him in verse 3. It's, it's Bathsheba's husband, we know. So David sent and inquired about the woman who he saw, and someone said, someone, I wonder who that was. Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So the first time he's introduced into the record is here, and he's called a Hittite. Now, there's a lot of people that are various ites, and like a Golanite or various ites in the Bible, and then they're from various kind of towns and places. But he's a Hittite, and it's not a town. It's a nation, a people, and a cultural force that have been around for a long time. Um, this, the green on here represents the Hittites at their maximum extent, according to archaeology and what we know of various inscriptions of other ancient people. They were a force to be reckoned with. Like, they, they weren't minor little guys. They were slightly nomadic, and their kingdom changes all the time. But this is where Uriah comes from, right? He's a Hittite. And Deuteronomy 7 said right at the very outset as Israelites are forming and going to take the land of Canaan, God says really clearly this, right? Deuteronomy 7, you will show no mercy to the Hittites. You will utterly destroy them. Now, God hates them. Why? Because they would only influence Israel to sin. That's, they, are, they are sin. They represent sin. We might say they represent the world. They certainly were for the time. They would cause Israel's failing into sin. All along with all those other, you know, the Girgashites and the Havites and all the, uh, the other ones. Um, now this is really crazy. They were pagan to the core. They had lots of weird gods and they did strange things. But Uriah, at some point, changed jerseys. Right? For, we don't know all the details, but somehow, somewhere along the way, Uriah was one of the few in that nation, that group of people that were pegging to the core, that saw the light, as it were, that came into the truth through some leaflet or preaching effort. I don't know, whatever it was, but somehow Uriah came into the truth and he totally, he totally changed jerseys. And he not only did he join the Israelites, young people, Uriah the Hittite joined the elite fighting force of none other than the king of Israel. He was an amazing warrior. And these are not just like 
guys that were better on the battlefield. These are guys that had all sorts of characteristics that led them to be leaders and help David establish the kingdom of God on earth under David's leadership. That's where Uriah comes in. He's not an Israelite. He's joined the team. And not just the team, he's right in the thick of the driving force. That's our character for tonight. One of David's elect group of mighty men. Now, I want to just think about those mighty men for a moment. Because if, if you're not aware of this, they're listed not too long later in 2 Samuel 23. So come to 2 Samuel 23. This is amazing. We are given a list of these elite mighty men. Now, it's not the only time this list appears. The list of mighty men also occurs in Chronicles, 1 Chronicles 11. And there is some differences, but that's not the subject of tonight. What we're interested in is the list that's given by the same author that recorded Uriah's integrity in chapter 11. So here we are in 2 Samuel 23. These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. And it starts listing them. And then the first section of the chapter goes through a number of little episodes of what these mighty men did. You might be familiar with those, right? But it highlights all of these qualities. And, and Uriah is here. Look at, where is Uriah mentioned? Where is he in this chapter? 39. He's the last one on the list. Now, if you go to Chronicles and look up the list of mighty men in Chronicles, he's not the last one. There's 16 people after him in Chronicles. But as the author is going through 2 Samuel and writing David's mighty men, he truncates the list and stops with Uriah. Is that a coincidence? It's totally not. Th this man was David's mightiest man in a whole different way. Maybe he didn't kill a lion on a snowy day in a pit, right, with his bare hands. But man, he did something else and a number of other things that was going to be far more mighty in moral value and power than some of these other guys. So Uriah stands out as the last one mentioned on the list in 2 Samuel. Now, I want you to scan through. This is gonna, we, we need to get some input for the next three minutes, okay? I want you to scan through the little stories, just scan your eyeball through and think about these men that are listed in 2 Samuel 23. And I need you to give me the qualities of what you think these guys have. Why are they the mighty men? What are their qualities that must be true with these guys in 2 Samuel 23? What is the qualities of the mighty men? Go. What must they be? Courageous. Courageous. Agree? Anyone disagree with that? I mean, the stories in here are insanely courageous. A line, uh, my favorite one's the line on this pit in the snowy day, but there's, there's far more. Courageous, definitely. Skillful. Skillful. What do you mean? Yes. Now, okay, we can't over glorify the military power of this, but it is glorified. So we're going to do it because it's the old kingdom. It's the old covenant. And that's what, what's happening here. But these guys were skillful and no doubt God was with them, but they trained hardcore. I think that's true. I can prove it, but we won't do that now. Well, give me some more qualities. Courageous, skillful. Intelligent, Intelligent yes, 100%. Loyal. Loyal, 100%. These guys would not give up. Like the stories in here are like incredible stories of loyalty. No matter what's thrown at them, these guys are not, they're tenacious. They are not giving up. Loyalty, what else? Keep going. Honorable, honorable? yes. These are honorable guys. These are not like your, your classic American military guys that, you know, pillage and do all sorts of other things on the side, even though they've got the weapons. These guys are honorable, godly men. Yes? Pardon? Resilient. Resilient. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> wow. I would have packed it in a long time ago. I do not want to be on this list. Faithful. Faithful. Yep. Divided. Devoted. Like all these things, we could keep going, right? I've got brave, strong, loyal. Some of these have come up. Trustworthy, focused, unflinching, unchanging. Now let's have a look at one example, and you've got to log this in your mind, thinking of Uriah. I'm pretty sure this is a famous list. It's kind of legend, right? Like this is a legendary thing, the mighty men, and there's these stories everyone knew about. Well, here's one of them. Think about this carefully. You might think this is disconnected to Uriah, 
but if you think carefully, you might make the connection. Either Uriah was involved in this, we don't know, or he definitely knew about it. Here we go, ready? Verse 13. Then three of the 30 chief men went down at harvest time and came to David at the cave of Adullam. And the troop of Philistines encamped in the Valley of Rephraim and were given heaps of detail on this event. David was then in the strongholds and the garrison of the Philistines was then Bethlehem. And David said with longing, oh, that someone would just give me a drink of the water from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. You can imagine, right? He's thirsty ass. And he's like, oh, that well, I wish I was back there. Someone just give me a drink. So the three mighty men broke through the camp of the Philistines, drew water from the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it back and brought it to David. And David took it and just like, yes, he pours it all over, drinks it down. Oh, it's so good. No, he takes it and he pours it out like right in front. I'm not drinking this, right? Look what he says. It's so point blank. Nevertheless, he would not drink it and he poured it out before Yahweh. Why? Why did he do it? Now think about this, all the mighty men. This, he's training these mighty men. How you learn about passion and loyalty and bravery is from David. He's your captain, right? Look what he says. And he said, far be it from me, O Yahweh, that I should do this. Is not the blood of these men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore, he would not drink it. These things were done by the three mighty men. And that would have rippled through that whole group and like, oh, like what's going on? Why didn't he do it? Explain it to me. Why did David not drink that water, but he poured it out? And if I run, I might actually run out of water up here now, but. hundred percent. He's, he's honoring the people that went to get it by saying, I'm not going to indulge myself. I don't deserve this. While other people's lives were at risk and fighting for God and doing these things, there is no way that I'm going to indulge myself, Right? This is not, that would be self-serving when other people are putting their life on the line. And so integrity and loyalty to the bigger cause becomes important rather than his wants. Now think about that. All of the mighty men would have learned that lesson. You do not indulge yourself and you do not serve yourself while other people are putting their lives on the line. Can you see 2 Samuel chapter 11? Think about that. All of these things are how he trained the mighty men. And this was ingrained into them and it would come back to him. Now Uriah also must have changed his name, right? Here's the, here's the other thing we know about Uriah. Does anyone actually know what it means? What's Uriah mean? Beautiful to this story. It's worth penciling in. How's what he got? Oh, you're writing down. Sorry. Anyone, anyone know what Uriah means? Obviously something Yah, right? Uriah Yah. Oh. Pardon? The flame of Yah. Oh, that's so good. Do you think a Hittite would have that name? No, he's definitely changed his name and his jersey. Okay, he's totally changed his name. Now you're thinking like your eyes probably searching around as he's learned the truth. He's like, I need a new name. Get rid of this, whatever this, what, who, not, who knows what he had, right? Some random name from the Hittites. He's like, I need a good name that's going to kind of encapsulate what I want to be. I'm going to be the flame of Yah. And that's what he is. So that's why the little lamp's on there. He becomes the flame of Yah. Changes his name. Remember, this man had everything taught to him from David. He had been inspired by David to serve God with total integrity as one of the mighty men. Now, I just want you to think about this, young people. Let's take the first lesson from Uriah. Here's a man, probably as a young person, who changed to take on the God of Israel and his purpose and his kingdom. He uh, changed teams, right? As it were. I've just lost, oh, there we go. So he changed teams. Now I want you to think about this. If you have recently been baptized or if you are baptized, this is exactly what you've done. You've changed teams and you've joined Christ the cause of God's kingdom through the king. We are Gentiles, so is he. But I want you to think about this young people and be really challenged by what Uriah is on about. He wasn't just an Israelite on paper. And he wasn't just an Israelite by name. And he wasn't just an Israelite by his jersey. 
He was fully committed to God and not just David. You might think all these guys are following David. A true mighty man was not following David. He was actually following God while David served God. And that's exactly what Uriah does. You know, young people, I think there's a challenge in here for us in Uriah as we're gonna see his integrity come through. It's actually, I would say, and I, I, you may disagree with me, but I feel like here in Adelaide, it's easy to be a Christadelphian. It's easy to change teams because for some of you, you've always grown up with it. Now, some of you guys might have to make a choice and maybe there's competing challenges in your mind and you have doubts that you work through, whatever. And finally, you've decided to follow Christ by faith. But there is a challenge, I believe, amongst us and our young people and also older brothers and sisters, young people. And that is joining Christ without real conviction or intention of standing firm for him. Now, this is what a Uriah challenges you as a young person on tonight. It's not an easy message, but it's the message from him. This is a man that took on the truth and every bit of his fiber was dedicated to it. He was going to stand for God, come what may, even if the king turned against him, and he did. I want Uriah to help you take stock of where you're at, young people. Are you just a Christadelphian? Was he just an Israelite? Are you a mighty man? a mighty young person committed to living out Christ and upholding the principles of the kingdom in you and your friends? Or are you a candle, a flame of Yahweh that's kind of dull and flickering and almost going out? And maybe the way you conduct yourself as a young person, rather than inspiring others with your integrity and devotion and desire to serve God, you're affecting the flames of other people too. The flame of commitment and inner resolve maybe is fading. Young people, we are not called to join Christ for the benefits of Christadelphia, young, per, young people in suburban. We are not called to follow Christ and to join kingdom principles because it's what we grew up with. Not even in the slightest. We are called to join out of full conviction and determination to live Christ in our life and to stand for it unswervingly. This is not half-baked Christadelphianism, right? Uriah was not. When there was plenty of other people in the kingdom that were, as you will find out and maybe have found out as you're looking at the friends and foes of David. This is a call, young people, tonight from Uriah to live and burn the flame of truth in your life, in your relationships with your girlfriends and boyfriends and stop making compromises and stand for God in your moral resolve, not just outside, not just by what you go to, not just by what you wear, but who you actually are on the inside. That is what Uriah was. He was nothing external. He was everything internal to what God had called him to be. This, young people, is biblical integrity. Uriah showed integrity in a time of darkness when all around him were half-baked allegiances and people that necessarily weren't totally taking it seriously. This is Uriah and this is his integrity. integrity. He chose to be faithful over being free as a Hittite. When you look at verses on integrity, and, and I encourage you to do it as a little outcome of tonight, if you want to work on it, and we all do, that's why we're here looking at Uriah, to look at integrity. If, if that's something that you know you need and who doesn't, right? Chase up this word integrity and see where it leads you. But here's the picture you build. Biblical integrity is honest, uh, being honest and adhering to strong morals. Not random morals, but God's morals. It's being undivided. The, the, the word has the sense of being true or whole or sincere to who you claim to be, not just who you present to be. This is the message of Uriah, the flame of Yahweh. And he was burning bright to the people around him if they could only walk in that light. That little phrase from Philippians is really relevant, isn't it, to Uriah? among whom you shine as lights in a dark world. I want to show you a quote that's not from the Bible, but I absolutely love it, and it stirs me every time I see it. And I believe it's Uriah to a T. A candle 
is a protest at midnight. It's a nonconformist. It says to the darkness, I beg to differ. That's what we're called to young people on a moral level, to stand up for God like we sing in all of our beautiful songs, to stand up for God and pierce through the darkest night. That's Uriah in a desperate time of darkness at the hands of David. Let's see his integrity, right? Um, we know this story, so we're just going to skate through some of the details, but we'll pick up his integrity. Chapter 11, verse 1. Everyone's out to battle. That's all the mighty men. So 2 Samuel chapter 11, they're all out to battle, the mighty men. Do you know who else was probably out of town at the time? Well, think about it. In chapter 11, we learned that they'd happened to take the ark this time. Now, it seems like they might have done that sometimes when they went out to battle. Maybe it was a, a thing on the battlefield where the soldiers could worship or they could seek guidance or inquire of God. We don't really know all the details, but what, what we do know is the ark was in the military camp. And that made the camp extra holy. Well, it was special to have the ark there. Not every military campaign used that. But this time they did. It's probably guys like Uriah that said, we should take the ark. David says, yep, go ahead and take it. I'm just chilling at home. Right? So at the ark goes, if the ark's there, who else is with them? The priests and the Levites, at least some of them. So you're looking at the city of David, which is pretty empty, save women and children. Agree? Like it's, this is the time of year when most of the men, maybe on rotation, are out to battle and they're establishing the kingdom. At this um, particular time, the priests and Levites, some of them were there as well. Bathsheba, I'm just going to, we're not going to say much about Bathsheba. It's not our focus tonight. But Bathsheba, I am certain, would have expected that David wasn't around. And people in the palace would have cleared out all but few servants. Most men were not in town. And all the other battles, to be fair, David wasn't there. So surely she would not expect him to be there. All through this story, though, David never leaves his room. He's only sending messages and they come and go and he never leaves the palace. Never personally involved. He's out there left to his own conscience and he's trying to cover his tracks. And the whole story revolves around messages. David sends to Joab. David sends to ask about Bathsheba. David sends to obtain Bathsheba. Bathsheba sends David. David sends to Joab. Joab sends Uriah. David sends Uriah to make him drunk. David sends a letter to Joab via Uriah. Joab sends to David with news. David sends a message to Joab, not to worry. David sends for Bathsheba. And finally, in chapter 12, verse 1, Yahweh sends to Nathan. He just cuts right into the story. He says, I've got a message and I'm going to send it. Amazing. That's how the story unfolds. Now, we're introduced to Uriah in verse 3. And we're, we've already looked at the fact that he's a Hittite, young people. But think about this, right? Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So his wife is Bathsheba. Who is Eliam? Do you know? I did not know. But when I found out, I almost fell off my chair. No, but it, this is amazing. Who is he? Well, he's actually mentioned in a chapter we've already looked at tonight. He is one of David's mighty men. He's in chapter, like, just look over he is chapter 23, just a few above Uriah, in verse 34. There is Eliam, and he happens to be the son of Ahithophel. Now think about that. Bathsheba's dad is one of David's elite mighty men, and her husband is one of David's elite mighty men, and they are both out to battle with the ark on behalf of David. That's incredible, young people. Think about that. Her dad's the son of Ahithophel. Now, this is how things were, right? I, hopefully you can see that. I did not know this before, but this shows you how messy things get. This is amazing. There's David and his son Absalom. I just put beside David Ahithophel. Ahithophel was his close counselor. So David has strong connection to Ahithophel. You'll see that in our next suburban, I think, right? Ahithophel is the dad of Eliam, named Amiel in 1 Chronicles 3, and Eliam is the dad of Bathsheba, right? So think about this. David's closest counselor, as he calls him in the Psalms, 
is the granddad of Bathsheba. Just let that think in what David actually did to mess things up in his court and in the palace, right? This is full on. The relationships here are very interconnected. And both those guys are David's mighty men. Amazing. Now, with all that in mind, when, David, when Bathsheba is taken, and some of, the message, some of the people in the court know about this, right? Because he sent a message. He's like, hey, who's that? And the message comes back. No, it's Bathsheba. Um, can you, I'm going to just go get her. So the servants, going in and out of the door of the palace, grab Bathsheba. People notice her coming in. Surely, right? So she comes in. And then she sends a note. It's her turn to send a note. And she sends a note to David. This is all she says. She says, I'm with child. In other words, it's over to you. What are you planning to do about this? I'm with child. Now at that point, young people, you've got to put your mind where David is. That would have struck terror into him. All the consequences he now is running through in his mind about what this actually means. Young people can never underestimate the nasty consequences that come from unfaithful behavior. And I want you to really think about that tonight. Some of your sins or some of the challenges or habits that you have not uncovered or you have not dealt with or brought to God or determined to change, some of the weaknesses in your integrity may be on a slow boil for a while, young people, but in the end, sin is nasty and it has really certain consequences. And it certainly did for David. It's a staggering outcome. Well, David needs to do something about this. So the first thing he does is sends to Joab and saying, I need Uriah right now. Now he's concocted the whole plan. He's got it. We know the story. So he calls Uriah and look what he says. Uriah is obedient, obedient as ever. But you can't help but think that when Uriah gets the message from Joab, Joab shows up and says, Uriah, David's one. Yeah, like David, isn't he? Oh no, he is back there. That's weird. Okay. I've never been called back before like this. Off he goes back, a little bit of a journey back to the palace. Shows up, servants escort him in. Some of them surely would have known that Bathsheba was just there, right? The, everyone knew the mighty men. So he comes in and David says this, right? This is where we, we understand the story. Verse seven, Uriah had come to him. David just asked Joab how he was doing and how the people are doing and how the war prospered. Now the English destroys that verse, right? From one point of view, this is what David actually said. He's inquiring about the shalom of Joab and the shalom of the people and the shalom of the battle. Like it's all Hebrew, three times peace. How's the peace of the people going? How's the peace of Joab going? How's the peace of the battle going all well? Like it's a real kind of just David's, how's it all going? And, and Uriah, who's been on the front lines, gives him a report. But we're not actually told what he said. All we're told in verse eight is that David then said, Uriah, go down to your house, wash your feet. So Uriah departed. Uriah's obedient, right? He departs from the king's house and a gift of food from the king followed him. Now think about that. As Uriah's walking out of the court, David says, send food down to his house, wine, food, drink, whatever. So he's expecting Uriah to go to his house. Uriah cruises out of the palace court. He's about to go down the steps. And he's like, no, nah, I can't do this. Goes back up the steps, hangs out with the servants by the door and sleeps there all night. But all of that food and drink showed up on Bathsheba's doorstep. Open the door, what's going on here? I don't know. All this stuff comes in. It just sits there, rots overnight because no one eats it. Maybe Bathsheba picks away at it thinking like, what's going on? With little things maybe kind of connecting in our mind. And I want you to notice the integrity of this man. Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his Lord and did not go down to his house. And when they told David, saying, Uriah didn't go down to his house, David said to Uriah, calls him back, hey, you, you've been on a long journey. Like, what are you doing? Why don't you just go down to your house, right? 
You can feel the tension and the awkwardness of what's going on. This is David. This is the king. This is the man after God's own heart. And now his sin, his mistake, is forcing him to either save face or confess and humbly come to God. He scraps that and he stri- tries to cover his tracks. He, he, this little expression we use, he's fig leafing. He's trying to cover stuff up, right? Whatever his little mistakes are, he's fig leafing over. And we do that. Our natural instinct is to fig leaf over our little sins or the big ones. We try and cover our tracks. And Uriah says this as he's in the middle of it. Uriah said to David, this is the only time Uriah speaks in the record, young people, so savor every word. The ark in Israel and Judah are dwelling in tents. And my Lord, Joab, and the servants of my Lord, Joab, are encamped in the open fields. And David's sitting in his little palace, right, with a feather bed. Shall I then go to my house and eat and drink and lie with my wife? Now you imagine saying this to the king, but don't forget, he's a mighty man. He's unflinching. He's brave. He's uncompromising and he's loyal to God. And he throws it in David's face. As you live... And as your soul lives, and he doesn't call him king, he called Joab his lord, but he does not say that to David, I will not do this thing. That is the most brave, loyal expression of integrity in in this huge dark time. It's amazing, young people. And if what you can take away from tonight is to be inspired by this friend that we have in Uriah to stand up for what you believe in. And it's not just preaching at work, whatever. We're talking within the ecclesia to stand up for moral principles and to stand up with moral integrity. What we do at our parties, what we're watching together, whether we're having sex with our girlfriend or boyfriend and relationships that are not appropriate, And that God says, don't do it. And there's reasons for it. Whatever the moral issue is, young people, whatever it is for you and your group of friends, the inspiration from Uriah is to stand up morally for what you believe. You know, it's interesting, right? David never said explicitly, why don't you just go down to your wife and lie with your wife tonight? It was implied. He said, just go home and, and chill out. But Uriah the last thing he says, and he saves it right to the end. No, I'm not going to do that. The ark, Israel, Joab, all your servants. And no, I'm not going to go home and lie with my wife. And that would have struck David so harshly because I believe now, young people, the two of them know what's going on. You cannot sleep at the door with all of David's servants and not be up chatting about what's going on and say, like, whoa, Uriah, I just saw Bathsheba. Right? Like, who knows what went on? Something like that would have happened, for sure. We can't be certain, but what he says here and how he speaks betrays a person who's standing up for God in front of someone who's not. Now, young people, my favorite thing that Uriah says is the very first words of his mouth. The ark. Oh, that is, it is so intensely beautiful. You are talking to the very man who put all of his resources into bringing the ark into the city of David. David, as you all know, loves the ark. And the first thing Uriah says to prick his conscience is, the ark, David, is in a paddock in a tent. I'm not going to my house, to my bed, to eat and drink and be with my wife. Now that should have Like that, I think what Job's doing is trying to prick David's conscience. Now you think about why he mentioned the ark. This is a staggering thing, right? David knew the ark. It was beautiful. That's where you inquire of God. That's the presence of God. But what's in the ark, young people? What's in that ark? And by the way, when David asked about the peace of everything in verse 7, he never asked, oh, and how's the ark doing? He left that out. It's too close to conscience. So what's in the ark from Sunday school? What do you remember? Kit? Aaron's rod that budded. budded. Doesn't seem too significant in this context. 
But yeah, that's right. You're right. Uh, the manna, jar of manna. What else? Ten Commandments. This is the ark. First thing Uriah says, oh, the ark, David. Now, if you just paused for a moment and thought about what Uriah said as he left, and you thought about the ark, you're like, oh man, I love the ark. The ark. In the ark is the Ten Commandments, the two tablets. What are the Ten Commandments? What's number six? What's number six, young people? Commandment number six. Close. Yes. Number six in the ark is you shall not murder. Number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Number eight, you shall not steal. Now, these are all the ones that relate to our relationships with each other, right? The first five are our relationship to God. David breaks every single one of the ones that apply to our relationships with each other. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. Nathan says he stole the poor man's lamb in chapter 12. Number nine, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And he's in the process of doing it with Uriah. Number 10, what's number 10? anything that's your neighbor's, including his wife. Now you think about that, young people. Here's Uriah. The first thing he reminds David of is the ark, which David was passionate about. And everything in that ark, he has broken. You see, young people, here's, here's the rub of what I think is going on. It is one thing to love the ark, to look after it, to rejoice over the ark, right? It's one thing to get excited about it and worship around the ark, but it's another thing entirely, young people, to live by what's actually in that ark. And Uriah is doing it and David is not. Sure, he loved it. In a moment of weakness and a lack of integrity in this context, he's all joyous about the ark, but he's not living what's in the ark. Young people, it's easy. Sometimes, if you're like me, to love the truth. I do, right? But sometimes I'm happy not to live what's inside it. Let's challenge each other tonight with this beautiful man, Uriah, and his fierce integrity to live what we know is true, to live what's in the box, right? What's in the truth. So David tries to get him drunk, something Uriah refused to do himself, young people, in verse 12. And he uses his power to persuade and try and influence Uriah. But it's, it's ironic, isn't it? That even a drunk Uriah has more integrity than a sober David. And in fact, if we really think about it, the one who's drunk is David, inebriated with sin, with lust and pride. He's driven himself into this pit. He's scrambling to get out. And it's all reared up to save face and cover tracks. But Uriah stands resolute. And when we sin, young people, we need those people around us, don't we? We need young people in our young people's group. We need brothers and sisters in our ecclesias that are willing to stand for sin and call it out. But do so in a way that helps people and strengthens conscience. Sometimes, if you're like me, we can bake our conscience so we don't see it. And I feel this happens amongst us. Maybe it happens amongst you as young people too. But it's okay to compromise morally on things you know are not actually what Christ has called you to do. But maybe your conscience has been baked and there's times where you feel like, well, I'm gonna do this with my girlfriend or boyfriend or with my group of friends tonight or this weekend because it doesn't bother me and we're all happy with it, it's okay. But cases like that, young people, show a conscience that's not lined up with God's. You might be okay with it, but God might not. And sometimes we just don't feel the sting of conscience but we keep beating it back down and covering tracks that lead us to more tricky matters like lies and deceit. Have you ever had that experience where you've done something wrong and your parents have asked you about it or it's kind of come back to them and what, the way you respond is, is actually just digs it a little bit deeper and then you have to, you have to pad around it. That, that's all our human experience, right? We struggle with that. 
but let's be friends like Uriah that prick conscience, stand firm, and show care to each other to help. We need to be Uriah to each other, to stand up, not perpetuate by joining in or endorsing or perpetuating by just not doing anything about it. Our flame goes out sometimes and darkness can settle in. He was a Hittite, but he changed jerseys and not even the king could challenge him. We're not called to be disciples by name, but by disciples by heart, by soul, by strength, and by mind. Young people, let's just see what happens in verse 14 to 24. We're not going to read all through it, but as we read it tonight, um, David can't do anything with this man. He's standing too strong in his faith. He's standing against him. He's doing exactly this, right? Exactly that as a flame of Yahweh. And David can do nothing about it, and it leads him to more sin. When surely what would have been good for David, obviously, is to now confess and repent and turn back to God. But he left it too long, and he continues in that sin. And you know what's amazing, young people? As Uriah stands firm, things get worse for him. Things get worse for him. Uriah doesn't come out of this alive. He comes out dead, struck down by a sinful king and a deceitful messenger. That's an amazing thing. We actually have to say it, don't we? He's actually killed for his integrity. He's killed for his integrity. And you know, young people, sometimes your integrity can be attacked or slandered, but you need to stand with God and for God. Integrity is not rewarded here for Uriah. He is set up and destroyed while another man tries to save face and does so by perpetuating lies and sin. It kind of sounds like Ecclesiastes in some ways. Ecclesiastes says that um, in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, we won't turn it up, it says, there is a just man who perishes in his righteousness. Or chapter 8 says, there are just men to whom it happens according to the work of of the wickedness of the wicked. And this is what happened, right? David's sin. Think about those relationships. Uriah dies. Bathsheba's remarried. Ahithophel ends up dying as well later in the record. Absalom dies. David and Bathsheba have a baby boy from that incident in chapter 11, and he dies as well, right? And now Bathsheba is referred to as the wife of Uriah, highlighting Uriah's integrity in that situation. You know, young people... If you were the average Israelite, David has let you down big time. And you might be disillusioned. You might be challenged by David's sinfulness as news spreads out of the palace and down through the corridors of communication. But Uriah didn't let us down, did he? He wasn't the king. He was a mighty man. But he didn't let us down. It's true, young people, that there will be times in your life where people you trust and care about let you down because of sin. And I just want you to remember this because it's something that has always stuck with me that a brother from California told me when I was a young person. People will let you down. Jesus never will. He actually told me that story because I was so um, slightly different, but he told me that little line. As a young person, I was sort of obsessed with the Los Angeles Lakers. And uh, me and my friend um, at the time, some of you might know who he is, Ben Brinkerhoff, went to the LA Forum, watched the Lakers play, and I was like, on cloud nine, it was amazing. And this brother, his name is David Lloyd, um, he knew that, and he sent, when I went back to Canada, he sent me a program for the game, the next game at the Forum, which is like a magazine with all the players and whatever. And I opened it up, flipping through, I'm like, oh, this is so cool, and then there's this little sticky note inside that said, the Lakers will let you down but Jesus never will, and I've never forgotten it. What that means, young people, is that we just have to put our trust in Christ and recognize that we are human and get on with standing up like Uriah. So there's a legacy of his integrity. He's dead, we know that, but there is a legacy, and we want to end on that positive legacy. 
He's last on the list in 2 Samuel 23, and we know that must be for a reason. He stands as a shining beacon as David's mighty men, the last one on the list in 2 Samuel 23. But he's also mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, and we want to go there now as we close. There is a legacy to his integrity, and this is what we need to take home, young people. It may not go easy to stand up for God, People may not always interpret you the right way. You might go through challenges, whatever it is, but integrity will never let you down because it's for the glory of God. It's not about your own pride. It's about putting your trust in God and standing for him. Now look at this, Matthew chapter one. This is phenomenal. The opening to the gospel, the line of Christ. Look what it says. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot Isaac, Isaac begot Jacob, Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez begot Hezron, and Hezron begot Ram. Ram begot Aminadab. Aminadab begot Nashon, and Nashon begot Salmon. Salmon got, well, here's something different. Boaz by Rahab. You never put females in lineages in the culture of Jesus' time amongst the Jews. It's no-no. It's male-oriented. Or you don't put females in lineages but the gospel of Matthew does, puts Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. Whoa, another one. Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David the king. David begot Solomon by Bathsheba. No, Bathsheba is never mentioned in the New Testament, young people, never. We sort of think there's five women mentioned um, the lineage of grace in, in Matthew chapter one. There's not. There's Rahab, Ruth, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Tamar, who's the other one? Mary. Mary, sorry, yes, thanks, Mary. And her of Uriah. It deliberately, just when you expect, oh, Bathsheba, no, it's her of Uriah. Uriah has nothing to do with the lineage of Christ, correct? Nothing. But he's in there, and it does two things. It highlights the sinfulness of this line, the human nature of this line that Christ comes from, to redeem but it also highlights this young people that Uriah has a legacy of integrity. Uriah is not really in the bloodline of Jesus at all, in no sense, but because he is so loyal, Matthew says, under inspiration, I will include him here for all to see. And it's an indictment on David to have him mentioned here. And it is, it's a reality check. But the integrity of Uriah echoes down into the New Testament and through the line of Christ. So here is what we know, young people, and here's what I want you to be encouraged by tonight. God knows when you stand for him. It's not for your pride, it's for God's glory. That's what integrity is really about. He does know, and he loves integrity, young people. Aim for it. You'll fail, but burn brightly. Burn fiercely. And do not let your flame diminish or diminish the flame of integrity in other young people. Push yourselves to godliness for the sake of God's kingdom and seek it first.